Hi guys and gals, Shane Stevenson, Director of Museum Collections and Curator here at the Buffalo Naval Park. And for today's video, it is, you only get this once, it's the 100th anniversary uh, today, the 8th of September, uh, 2023. It's the 100th anniversary of the Honda Point disaster. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I've got one of those ubiquitous PowerPoints that I like to show, and we'll run through a little bit of the disaster itself and why it is the largest peacetime loss in U.S. Navy history. So I hope you enjoy and come along for the ride. Okay, so as with most disasters, right, uh, there's part nature in some of them, and certainly potentially human error in most of them, especially when it's the interface between man uh, and technology, ships, planes, things like that. Uh, and this one was no different. We have to go back, though, seven days before the 8th of September, 1923, and talk about the uh, infamous uh, Tokyo earthquake, 7.9 uh, magnitude, about 100,000 people uh, perished. Uh, and as we've seen now with the ubiquitous cameras everywhere, you've probably seen footage of tsunamis and things like that where water is traveling because of the earthquake. Uh, water is traveling. There's a lot of undercurrents, and when it hits land, it rises up uh, and becomes a tsunami. Well, back in 1923, this happens. It takes about six or seven days for that wave and that wall of water uh, to reach. Uh, California and the West Coast. So no doubt, uh, we don't know of any tsunamis, I don't think, uh, on the West Coast. But certainly, it's creating a lot of undercurrent and swells that would have probably not been there at the time. It might even affect the weather. We know that this day was pretty foggy and rainy um, on the West Coast, and that also aided in the disaster itself. Some technology, all right? Radio navigation was only about two years old. And so they put radio transmitters and receivers in the navigation uh, bridges. And as we've seen time and again, uh, the people who are using the technology for the first time were more than likely not trained in it uh, while they were in school. And therefore there is a general mistrust. Uh, we see that with uh, radars at the beginning of World War II. And of course, the night battle at Guadalcanal is a good example of not using that technology uh, to its foremost. At the time, most people who were trained were still relied on dead reckoning. All right, you're getting sight lines to a topography, to surfaces, or to stars. And then you're gauging how far you're traveling based on that topography. And the third thing is uh, interpretation of orders, which I will talk about. So all of the ships of the Honda Point disaster were of the Clemson class. There's 156 of them uh, created for World War II. Uh, all 14 in this uh, destroyer division, uh, 11, were constructed between 1918 and 1919. The general specs are they're averaged about 314 feet in length, 32 feet at the widest beam. You know, they're known, known as uh, four stackers or flush deckers or 1,200 tonners. Uh, and so, yeah, you'll see 1,250 ton displacement, uh, 32 knots top speed, and roughly 100 sailors on each. Prior, uh, during World War I, there would have been maybe 115, 125. But we've also seen time and again that after there's a, uh, a ba uh, there's a war, conflict, then there's peace and there's resolution, military budgets shrink. 
and this was part of them. So at the time of the Honda Point disaster, each Clemson would have had about 100 men on board, not the 115 to 125, roughly, uh, that they would have seen during wartime. They're shrinking the budget by having less personnel on board each ship. Here is a, a Destroyer Squadron 11. All right, there are 14 ships. Uh, I prior to that I called them Des Div. All right, a Destroyer Division 11 because there is a Destroyer uh, Desron 12 as well, and they were controlled by a Rear Admiral. So he was like the squadron commander made up of Desron 11 and Desron 12. Um, the way I interpret that is it's almost like the squadron. Uh, it doesn't have a number, but it's made up of these two, say, divisions. But doing the research and stuff, they call them Desrons. All right, so Desron 11 was made up of 14 ships. You'll see here their outcomes and their fate during the Honda Point disaster. Uh, the total losses were the Delphi, the SP Lee, the Young, the Woodbury, Nicholas, Fuller, and Ch Chancy, or Chauncey. Uh, damaged but survived means uh, these two ships were slowing down. Uh, they hit rocks, but at a, a very low speed, and they were able to uh, break themselves away uh, from the rocks and shoals. That's the Farragut and the Summers. And the last five uh, in the line, Percival, Kennedy, Paul Hamilton, Paul Hamilton, Stoddart, and Thompson were all uh, able to avoid it altogether. So what was going on pre-disaster? All right, they were running Pacific battle maneuvers and exercises with Desron 12. And they were up in the Northern Pacific uh, around Puget Sound. So with the maneuvers over, they were gonna travel back to Homeport in San Diego with a stopover and uh, uh, a port in San Francisco. So they met, each of the uh, squadron commanders met with the rear admiral, a guy by the name of uh, Sumner uh, Cattell. That's how I would pronounce that. And not only are you shrinking personnel, but peacetime navies had a limit on the speed that they could travel at cruising speed, which was 15 knots. And that was a fuel saving measure. So Rear Admiral Sumner Cattell tells them, hey, to steam home, the budget has the budget has been increased a little bit. And you, if you chose to, you could steam at 20 knots back to home port. So this is where we get into the interpretation of orders. Uh, the Captain Edward H. Watson of Desron 11 interpreted those orders wholeheartedly and with relish. And he said, oh, we just got uh, an order from the Rear Admiral that we can steam home at 20 knots. Let's do it. And those 14 did. Captain uh, James Toom, Desron 12, uh, was in the room uh, with Watson and uh, Cattell, and he interpreted that as a directive or an order, but one that they didn't have to follow, right? So he chose to uh, steam back to San Diego more slowly. For radio navigation, <laughs> get your laughs in now, everybody. Uh, this is my little interpretation uh, and drawing of what radio navigation was at this time. All right, again, about two years old, they had been placed aboard uh, Navy vessels and ships. Uh, and so what you're seeing there on the left is the land and the shoreline and the land-based RDF station. You have the ship traveling and just say north, uh, and they're bouncing radio signals to that station. And so what happens is the station itself is looking for the longest or the strongest signal. That would, interp that would be interpreted as the ship is parallel with the station out in the harbor or uh, in the ocean. So at that moment, when they get the strongest signal, they then radio uh, the compass bearing 
uh, and location to the ship itself, and then they can plot that on navigational charts. And then as they steam away, of course, there's still radio signals, but they're getting weaker and weaker. Uh, so I see it as weak, 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 strongest signal there. Let's get that information to the ship as quickly as we can. Weak, 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 as it goes away. I could be wrong. That's how I interpret it. So please, if you have questions or comments, uh, let me know where the fault is. But at this time, that's my interpretation of what radio navigation was in 1923. Images speak for themselves. All right, so I got to get out my notes now. And therefore, my glasses. All right, this is a great shot from a bite. You can see the plane, uh, the wing of a plane. So they're flying at a bird's eye view. And you'll see all seven ships of the disaster. All right, the first one, the first in the line was the Delphi, DD-261. She plowed into the rocks first and sounded the alarms. You'll see her uh, in the center, upper left, uh, and it's listed. It's really nicely they listed in the order that uh, they crashed among uh, the rocks. Right after that is the SP Lee 310. All right, what she tried to do is she saw the Delphi in distress, she heard the alarm, and she turned to point port to avoid the collision, and she swung broadside right into the rocks. And you can see that. She is broadside, uh, starboard side is against the rocks in this image. The third ship was the USS uh, Young, 312. She made no alterations to her speed or her course, all right? The rocks tore right through her hull, and you can see her capsized there in the center of the photograph, or upper center of the photograph. The next in line were the Woodbury, the Nicholas, and the Fuller. That's uh, 309. Now she is in the center of the photograph. Uh, the Nicholas is 311. So she ends up, if you look in the upper left, she's in the upper left. Uh, so even though they were steaming in line, uh, Nicholas ended up well, uh, I think we're well north, if we're looking at this rightly, well north of all the other ships. And the Fuller is 297, right there below uh, the Woodbury. 296 right above where it says Bridge Rock. That's the USS Chauncey. She noticed the young in distress, went to help, and instead also crashed in uh, to the rocks and the shoals that you see there. So the Chauncey, so the young had probably start to capsize again through the fog. Now all the alarms are blaring as much as they can. Uh, they probably have a searchlight. They shine it on the young. They see it's in distress. They go to help. And lo and behold, uh, the Chauncey also crashes. So they're there, the first seven ships of the line. All right, they're all losses. The Farragut and the Summers, as I mentioned, ran aground, uh, but at a slower speed, and they were able to back astern and away. And the last five all broke formation because they heard and saw what was going on, uh, turned out to sea, and avoided all of the damage. Uh, avoided damage altogether. These last five immediately sent out lifeboats, and it took about 24 hours to rescue everybody. 20 men of the young, all right, DD-312 right there in the middle, capsized, going full speed, ripped open her hull at the keel. 20 men of the young and three men of the Delphi, uh, the flagship, all right, 261, uh, were lost. So a total of 23 men were lost. Here's another shot. You got the Delphi uh, in the upper left corner. Uh, you have the Delphi there. Uh, the young is completely capsized as well. The Chauncey, you can see, which was going to rescue uh, men from the young. All right, and then another shot down below.
So all seven captains and commanders of the ships that ran aground and the various navigators were brought before a general courts martial. It was the largest single group in U.S. Navy history to be court martialed uh, uh, at the same time. Captain Watson, who was, as I mentioned, uh, the leader of the Squadron 11, uh, was stripped of his senior seniority, but not of his rank. All right, three other captains were admonished for their role. Uh, the the courts martial charge was neg negligence and uh, culpable inefficiency to perform one's duty. In addition to the human toll, about $11 million worth of ships and equipment uh, were lost. So, yes, that happened. Uh, there is a plaque. Uh, I believe it's probably a little weather, weather worn from what I've seen in photographs uh, on the internet. Uh, but today is the 100th anniversary of the Honda Point disaster, and uh, we'd like to remember uh, the men lost. I don't have their names, uh, but 23 men is 23 men. So we'd like to remember them and the ships lost. Uh, and just due to navigational errors, swells and current uh, changes because of the earthquake, uh, the navigation, and the uh, choice to steam at 20 knots in fog and rain. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave comments down below. Uh, if, if there's anything that I am misnaming or mislabeling, uh, the radio, uh, navigation, things like that, please let me know in a comment. And uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone.